Thy word is strength. Thy word is power. God, your word is force. And your word is Unto my feet and a light. Unto my path. Hi, I'm Alan Daniel, and I want to welcome you once again to our Bible study here at Bible Talk, where we gather every Friday night to broadcast live around the world. So I'm joined here by my lovely wife, Alice. Hello, and, everyone. And my brother, Mark Switos. Hello. And by you all. And we're blessed hey. that we can be together in the name of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. gathered in his name. Um, we're continuing on in our, our study of Paul's first letter to the Church of the Thessalonians. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to pick up where we left off last week in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to start at verse 14. But just before we do, I'm going to ask Mark to just kind of lead us in a prayer to start off the evening. Oh, Lord, we just thank you that we have the opportunity to be here. And just, Lord, open our eyes, our hearts, and our minds to what you have to say to us tonight. And just guide us in our lives and this Bible study here. Just be with us tonight so we can glean from your word. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to do something a little bit different tonight. Um, we're going to take this on a track. Once again, I want to remind you that our purpose is to learn about the Word of God. And of course, we're talking more than anything about the Word who was made flesh and dwelt among us, the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, but you'll, you'll see where we're going. If you take notes during Bible studies, I promise you tonight would be an excellent time. Well, this study would be an excellent time to take notes. So get your pens, your pencils, your paper, what have you. If you can't do that, remember you can always go back and re-watch the study. Or if you'd like, you can write to me at office at BibleTalk.com. Just send me an email and I will email you back a copy of the notes for this week. Yeah. All right, because this is going to go in a place that I think is, is very important and very interesting tonight. Let me start off by reading uh, from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm going to read from verse 14 through to verse 16. Mm -hmm. Paul wrote, For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you also endured the same sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men, hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they might be saved. With the result that they are always filled up with the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the utmost. Here's the Apostle Paul. And remember, when he came to Thessalonica, he came from Philippi, where he had been persecuted, wrongly, illegally jailed. And he comes here, he, when he first came, and he starts preaching, he goes to the synagogue, which was his habit. When he went into a new area, he would go to, the, and he would start, bring the gospel to the Jew first, and then to the Gentile, go into the synagogues. And when he did, it created an uproar. Okay? Uh, and they persecuted him, literally forcing him out of town, from which he left Thessalonica and went to Berea. So... He is being oppressed, he is being persecuted, the gospel is being attacked by the, by the quote-unquote people of God, the Jews. So I wanted to start by talking about Paul's relationship with the Jews, okay? Mm -hmm. This is really important to understand this. Because when he's talking about the Jews, he doesn't mean every Jewish person. Because remember, as he's doing this, Jewish people are being saved. He is talking about that organization of Jews who, claiming to be the people of God, opposed the gospel of God. Okay? So he was persecuted throughout his entire ministry by, by the Jews. He'd been caused much trouble by the Jews when he first arrived in Thessalonica, to the extent that he had to leave the town, right? And he went from there. And yet, in spite of that fact, he continued his practice of bringing the gospel to the Jews first in Berea when he left here. And that's recorded in Acts 17.10. When he went to Berea, he still went to the Jews first. 
From Maria, he went to Athens. He still went to the Jews first. That's Acts 17, 17. You want to check these things out. When he left Athens, he went to Corinth, and he preached to the Jews first, still, in Acts 18, verses 2 and 4. When he left Corinth, he went to Ephesus, and again, to the Jews first. So in spite of the fact that he's being maltreated and being opposed by the, all of these Jewish people, it doesn't change his practice of bringing the message of the promised Messiah of Israel to the Jews. Well, he understood that it, the God is, should have used the Jews to bring, to bring that message to the rest of the world. Well, he was a Jew bringing that message to the rest of the world. But he, okay, okay. But he, he wanted that to spread in the Jewish community, then to the world. Okay. Okay. Yes. So, in, in each of those places that I just mentioned, and the, you know, you can follow Paul's travels through the book of Acts, right? Going from Philippi, to Thessalonica, to Berea, to Athens, to Corinth, to Ephesus, and then on. Now, after that, he begins to circle on going back to where he had established churches. So, on this part of the journey, he's going to these places fresh, and it's always to the Jews first. So, there were Jews who were saved in Berea, and Athens, and Corinth, and in Acts, in, in, in Ephesus, right? Did Paul dislike the Jewish people? Of no. Okay. Uh, okay. I want to read your verse, all right? I am telling the truth in Christ, he wrote to the Romans. I'm not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed separated from Christ for the sake of my brother and my kinsmen, according to the flesh. That's he wrote in, in Romans chapter 9. He was willing to give up his he salvation. He was willing to give up his salvation for the Jews, were that possible. And by the way, it is not possible. Right. You can't be saved for somebody else, all right? But the fact is, his heart was still burdened with a love for the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. That brings me to the topic that I want to talk about tonight, because I think this is so important. Talking about all these Jewish people, and remember, we're talking about the people of God who are yet opposing the plan and the work of God. Mm -hmm. That's still going on today. Mm -hmm. And what we call today is cults. All right? Listen to these verses. All right? Now you're not saying the Jews are cults. What I'm going to do is talk about what a cult is. I want to define... Now, one of the reasons this is an important topic and timely is we're doing this... This study tonight, it is October 2011. We are in the election cycle for the presidential election here in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And one of the issues that has arisen in the last couple of weeks and has been just all over the news throughout the United States, and I'm going to assume in places outside the United States, is that two of the candidates, one of the candidates claims to be an evangelical Christian, Maybe more than one, but, but one does, and that's Rick Perry, who is a leading candidate. Mm -hmm. And another leading candidate is Mitt Romney, who is a practicing Mormon. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what, what happened was somebody in the Perry camp made the statement a couple of weeks ago that Mormonism is a cult. Well, that just raised an entire brouhaha mm -hmm. that has been going on for a couple of weeks and is not settled yet about... Is it wrong to call somebody, a, you know, a member of a cult, this religion a cult? And it's just, it's been a real thing. So I, I think it's important it's that we understand what a cult is. And the reason I feel that that's a, it's a proper place for that is here, is because who's opposing this? Think, think of what he said here, all right? You, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea because you endured the same sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen. So he's talking about the Jews being persecuted by the Jews, mm -hmm. and now Gentiles being persecuted by their, own, by their Gentiles, right? Mm -hmm. And these are the people, when he talks about the Jews, he says, who killed Jesus and killed the prophets and drove us out. So here, the group that, as Mark said, that who were entrusted with the Word of God, and that's what Scripture says, who were given the commission to bring the Word of God into the rest of the world, way back from the time of the prophet Isaiah, mm -hmm. here they are opposing the gospel, or bringing forth a different teaching, a different gospel. All right. 
So what I want to say is that's a, that's the definition of a cult. Well, I want to define that more clearly, right? Just listen to these two verses to, to start this off. This is from Jesus speaking in one of his letters to the churches in Revelation. This is Revelation 2.9. Jesus said, I know the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. That's Revelation 2.9. And then Paul writes, again, in Romans, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but one who is inwardly. Way back in Deuteronomy, even in the law, God said that he required that they circumcise the foreskin of their heart. It's an inward thing. Mm -hmm. But both of these verses, here's Jesus and Paul saying, well, just because they call themselves Jews doesn't make them Jews. And, and interestingly enough, that's still a debate that goes on, uh, not, not satisfactorily answered in Israel today, about who is a Jew. I, I, okay, I'm going to just say this, I don't know, again, I'm trying to stay focused and on track here tonight. But as a matter of fact, the three of us, not long ago, were in Israel. And I went to Israel to share the gospel. And in the process of doing this, I had, I had been scheduled to go to Pakistan while we were on the road, and I met with the Consul General of the Embassy to England while we were in London uh, for Pakistan, and he processed our paperwork through Islamabad, the capital of uh, Pakistan, and we were, re Alice and I were refused entry into Pakistan. And it was a very strange situation. I mean, very strange. I was getting calls from pastors in Pakistan telling me they'd provide armed guards for me and that kind of the Islamic police were there investigating Alice and I. And at the end of the day, they didn't let us in. So what happened was, in fact, that in the, in the night, the Lord spoke to me and said, will you go someplace where the gospel will be less received than Pakistan? I don't think there's a lot of places where the gospel is less received than there. But I said, yes. And he said, all right, Israel. Now, I don't think that most Christians see Israel as a place that today opposes the gospel, because so many Christians go there. And Christians are more than welcome to go there. But Christians are welcome to go there because they provide economic and political support for Israel. You are not welcome to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's not a welcome thing in Israel. As a matter of fact, if you go on, on the embassy websites for the nation of Israel and start looking, you will see that missionaries, Christian missionaries, are ranked with terrorists. Because Israel, religious Jews or Jews, see Christians who preach the gospel as having a desire to, to turn Jewish people into Christians, thus diminishing the nation, taking people out of the, uh, out of the religion. That's not the case if it's being done properly, by the way, because the heart of God is that they don't, they don't stop being Jewish, because what he wants them to do is find that promised Messiah of Israel who came in fulfillment of all the prophecy. Jesus didn't stop being a Jew. He didn't break the law. He fulfilled the law. But they see it as another Jew dying. So they, they do. And, and uh, again, you know what? We're not going to finish this in one night. Okay. Mm -hmm. The, the idea was, and I sat and I had a lovely conversation. We stayed, Alice and I were blessed to be able to stay with a very religious, older Jewish couple, uh, very, very knowledgeable. I'd say he was a Bible scholar. And, and just sit with him for three days at his dining room table and reason, reason the scriptures with him. And I really began to understand their, their mindset. Uh, and have more sympathy for their mindset in as much as they see Islam, the Palestinians and Islam, as wanting to uh, destroy Israel by conquest. But they also see Christians as wanting to destroy Israel by conversion. Because their perception is every time a Jew becomes a Christian, one of the faithful has been lost to the country, right? One less Jew. One less Jew. And that's, that's the way they see it. That's not correct. Uh, at least it shouldn't be correct. But that's the way they see it.
uh, when we were in Israel, somewhere along the line, I heard a story of a Jewish person accepting the Messiah as, or Jesus Christ as the the, as a as the yeah. Messiah. Yeah. But he was of the age to go in the military. And he had a call from a military officer questioning him about his his conversion. And at the end of it, he was told that he is he can't do military service in in the Israeli army because he became a Christian. Right. Or well, but you, okay, that's that's understandable to me. Yeah. I don't I don't understand because they you know, um, I'm gonna talk about the cults tonight. And we will talk about Mormonism, for example. And if I had a brother or sister in the Lord mm -hmm. who I knew to have a biblical belief in Jesus Christ and found out that they had left and gone and become a Mormon, I would mourn over that person. I would see them mm -hmm. as lost to our faith. Right. And that's exactly the way the Jews look at it. Now, they're, I'm not saying that they're correct. They are indeed wrong, but that is their perception. And why is it their perception? Because a veil has been placed across their eyes. That's what the Word of God says. Mm -hmm. So our prayer is that that veil be lifted from their eyes and they receive the promise of God the Father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who promised, spoke to Moses and said he was going to send one like Moses, but greater than Moses. So, okay. So, I mean, um, so what, I, what I want to talk about is the cults, because that's what it is when people portray themselves, and I'm going to talk about, we're going to talk about Christian cults, right? When they portray themselves as the people of God, when they portray themselves as Christians, but don't hold to biblical beliefs or to, you know, what we understand as being faith in the atoning salvation work of Jesus Christ on the cross and his lordship in our lives, then they are a cult. Now, you see, the, the word cult has, if you go to a dictionary, you'll find that it has a technical definition. But that doesn't really suit the times anymore, right? It doesn't apply any longer in general usage. I'm using the term today, cult, to religions or organizations. I'm not talking about individuals. We're talking about organizations, right? Which call themselves Christians, but depart from the truth of the gospel. Okay, I want to make that distinction clear that well, I'm talking about the organizations. Organizations are cults. People can, there can be people who are members of cults, but that's not what we're dealing with here right now. We're dealing with the organization. So, w with that definition in mind, all right, cults being so-called Christian, then I would categorize other religions with no pretensions towards historic Christianity or biblical Christianity as world religions. That would include Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, you know, those are world religions. They make no pretension to being Christian. Mm -hmm. So they're not, they're not a cult. And in addition to that, because Al says that the answer is always three, right? And she's incredibly right. Why is that incredible to you? Because it's, it sounds so silly. The answer is always three, but it always works out that way somehow. That there, there is the true faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and his promised Messiah. Mm -hmm. And then outside of that, you, have, you can break everything else down into three groups. There are cults, people that call themselves Christians who are not. There are world religions, and then there are world systems. Humanism, for, for example, is a world system. They say, well, okay, they're atheists. They, they believe that there is no God. So, you know what? They have a belief system. <laughs> it's a belief system. To a lot of people, I promise you, that politics and political involvement is a world system. All right? And by the way, let me make one thing clear. If I'm talking about these cults and, and what brought this topic up in my mind was what's going on in the news, I am not by any means endorsing one candidate or speaking out against another candidate because I just I don't get involved in that. All right? My concern is not for who wins or who loses the upcoming election in the United States. My concern is that Christians, those people who have accepted the atoning work of Jesus Christ, 
who have accepted him as their Lord and Savior are not deceived and led astray by the devil and his minions coming along and offering a substitute or imitation that deludes people into following. All right? Here, let me give you what I see as a biblical definition of a cult. And this is straight from the Word. This is the Apostle Peter in his second letter. He wrote, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. These are springs without water, and mists driven by a storm, for whom the black darkness has been reserved. That's 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 2, and verse 17. So he is saying, this is Peter in the New Testament, after, again, remember, this is after the, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's saying that there are going to be these people, these false teachers, these false prophets who arise introducing destructive heresies, secretly introducing them, subtly, right? So you, we need to be on guard. We need to be aware of the schemes of the devil. So we're going to talk about cults. How do you, how do you determine what a cult is? That's been, as I say, it's been a gigantic debate here in the United States of America for the past couple of weeks. I want to give you the characteristics of a cult. The following is a list of characteristics which generally mark the operations and form of a cult. I'm going to give you four things here, right? Cults have a human leader who, at least in practice, if not openly, is infallible. If they don't openly say it, in practice that's the truth, right? There's a human leader who is infallible. Number two, an authoritative device which, again, at least in practice, if not openly declared, supersedes the scriptures. The third thing is a required commitment to the organization rather than to the Lord, a as usual, at least in practice, if not openly declared. All right? And fourth and last, a hierarchical structure that places itself itself being its leaders, its priesthood, whatever it has, but places itself between the quote-unquote common believer and God, rather than placing themselves alongside the believers. Okay? You get those? Now, theologically, all cults have the following three points in common, although their proclaimed purposes may cloak these in great subtlety. Number one, they reduce God the Father to a lower level than is rightfully His. Number two, they present an appraisal of Jesus that reduces either Him or His atoning work. Number three, there is the elevation of man and His ability. And fourth, they present salvation as the result of works rather than the free gift of God. Okay? No matter what Satan does, and no matter what guise he puts on it, those things, you're going to find those things in a cult. Where does it, where does it, what's the origin of cults? Now, by the way, um, I, I started my ministry on the streets of New York City back in the 70s. And I had a great exposure to cults, working with people trying to get them out and involved in cults. Mm -hmm. Because I worked in Times Square back in the old Times Square before it was cleaned up. And it was filled with, with Jehovah's Witnesses, with Moonies, with Harry Krishnas, with, I mean, you know, they just flooded with them, trying to capture all these young people flooding into New York City to find fame and fortune. But that's not the origin of cults. No. Where did cults start? Cults start, number one, in the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. All right? Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. Genesis 3.1 He was subtle, he was crafty, and the first thing he does is call the, the word of God into question. That's where it starts. 
I mean, there's, you know, it says there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, they, may, they might put new clothes on it, but it's still the same old line. Where else did it originate? That, that was an individual attack. But I said it was an organization. We're talking about cults as organizations. Mm -hmm. On the plains of Shinar. You know what the plains of Shinar are? That's where they built the Tower of Babel. They said, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven and let us make for ourselves a name. Genesis 11.14. That's where religion, I mean, organized religion starts. Prior to that, you don't have, you don't have organized religion taking place. It's all, you know, we're, we have a lot of individual things going on. But in, at, at Babel, in the plains of Shinar, when they built the Tower of Babel, they brought together an organization. They brought the people together to do what? To find their own way into heaven and get a name for themselves. God designed us to have a name, to share that name. We're the bride, there is a bridegroom. In spite of what our culture does today, the bride takes the name of the bridegroom. We are to take upon ourselves that name, the only name given by which men can be saved, that name that's above all names, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. Right? They wanted to build, build their own way into heaven and get a name for themselves. All right, let's just look uh, at the characteristics a little bit one by one, all right? I said that there's an infallible human leader. Cults have, and by the way, that, what I'm saying is, take, take down these notes, think about what I'm saying to you, and then use these things, because I'm going to give you a scripture, to examine whether organizations that you encounter are true Christianity or cults. That was what the debate was about going on here, right? An infallible leader. The Word of God says that we have a leader who is infallible. Truly man, yet truly God. Jesus Christ said, Do not be called leaders, for one is your leader. That is Christ. Matthew 23.10 We have an infallible leader. Paul, who wrote this letter to the Thessalonians, said in Ephesians, he said that Jesus is the head over all things to the church, which is his body. He's the head, right? Yes. Not a man, mm -hmm. but he is. Cults work and strain, not to say lie, which they do, to present a picture of a perfect leader. Talk to anybody that's in a cult, and they'll tell you about their leaders. Their, their leaders are perfect, right? It seems to me that the Lord goes out of his way in Scripture to show us the failings, the humanness, of those that he has chosen to do his work through. Abraham, Moses, David, Peter, and Paul. Over and over. Mm -hmm. I mean, Abraham. We, we see his failings, right? God doesn't hide that from us. Moses, striking the rock when he's not supposed to. That's why he wasn't allowed into the promised land. Disobedience. Yeah, to do disobedience. David, the anointed of God, a man after God's own heart who God anointed to be the, the, over the, his own people. Look at what he did with, with Bathsheba and Uriah. I mean, God makes it a point that we know. Peter, you know, his failings, he was confronted by Paul in Antioch, confronted to his face in front of all the other believers. Paul saying, you know, that, that he was the chiefest of sinners. What does he look for, then, in the people that he chooses to work through, if they're not perfect? Here's what he looks for. All right. Because, for example, we know, listen to this verse. Now, the man Moses was very humble, more than any man who was on the face of the earth. Numbers 12, 3. Humility. Why? John the Baptist saying, I must decrease that he would increase, because it is about the exaltation of of God, not a man, not an organization. Remember when Peter, in the book of Acts, when Peter was sent by God to go to the house of Cornelius, right? So when Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter raised him up saying, stand up. I too am just a man. Acts 10, 25 and 26. 
Peter would not tolerate somebody bowing down at his feet. Look at the leaders of cults today that you, you can think of. How does that line up? Test it against the word. It says we're to examine all things and hold fast to that which is good. The second thing I said was an authoritative device which supersedes the scripture. Now, it's not always what they declare, but it's what they practice, right? Bear in mind that the last thing that the adversary or the cult leaders want is for those who serve them to have they, is the word of truth that sets men free. Remember Acts chapter, I mean, John chapter 8, Jesus saying, if you abide in my word, you'll know the truth. Truly my disciples, you'll know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And would you say their foundation would be deception? It has to be. I mean, I've, you know, there's no gray area between the truth and a lie. Mm. It's either one or the other. And a half a truth can be a whole lie, right? So, the devil, with his subtlety and his craftiness, Genesis back to 3, 3 1, mm. and it, it were, it's a revelation in the word through the Apostle Paul that he comes as an angel of light. That's what he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, right? Yes. So, he wants people bound up. Jesus came that we might have life. Satan comes to steal, to rob, to destroy, right? to kill. Well, cults always say that they operate by or hold in high esteem scriptures. A close look will always show that in practice they have complete disregard for the very same scriptures. Mm -hmm. right? With a close look. You can't just look at this on the surface. You've got to examine it. That's what it says. You've got to appraise it. Right? One group, for example, that, that I had contact with when I was pastoring up in, in New York back in the late 70s and early 80s, um, we encountered and had some people come out of a cult and into our services and into our, into our group. They state that the Bible is the only source of authority. Sounds good so far. Then they go on to show all of the errors in the scriptures and how they correct them. The founder said that the Gospels belong in the Old Testament and were written to the Israelites sometimes and sometimes to the Gentiles, but not to the church. So on the one hand, they say they believe the scriptures and that's their authority, but then they go ahead and change the scriptures. Oh, the Mormons. Now, I'm just going to talk about this stuff. The Mormons declare that the scriptures are the word of God. Sounds good so far. But those very same scriptures have some errors and things left out that their founder, Joseph Smith, corrected or added. They also added three other scriptures, quote-unquote, which both contradict and supersede the Bible. The Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. And it's interesting to know that, in their view, the only book of the four which has errors is the Bible. The Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, I'm not going to list all of the cults, because we don't have time for that. But these are some of the major ones. The Jehovah's Witnesses say that the Bible is the Word of God. They also say that they are the only ones who can rightly translate it. Everybody else's Bible contains errors. Like, errors like saying Jesus is God. So they wrote their own version called the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. Of equal importance to them, of course, are the prophecies that come forth from their leadership, even though they have a pattern of being wrong. They have been wrong over and over and over and over. And by the way, it's not midnight yet, but there's another guy who's running around when he said that uh, the world, you know, Jesus was coming back or the world was going to end in May. And he said, oh, no. So today, this very day as we're broadcasting, he said Jesus is coming back again today. I think we, we missed that one too. By the way, a test of a prophet is you better be right. Hundred percent, hundred percent at that. Now, the Unification Church, the Moonies, you know they're still around. They're not as prominent. They're not as prominent. They're still around and they're still active. They claim that the Bible is, or was, God's word, mm -hmm. at least for a time. Now they have a new revelation from God called Divine Principles, written by their infallible leader, Sun Young Moon, who was still around. So they're still around. But see, on the one hand, they say, you know, they give, they give lip service to the scriptures mm -hmm. and then turn around and change it, change it. Or add to it. Right. Christian science, which is neither Christian nor scientific. Mm -hmm. 
says that the Bible is fine. However, their founder, Mary Baker Eddy, received new information from God. This new word called divine healing, and it, and it shouldn't come as a surprise that it contradicts scripture, of course, and it's their foremost guy. Listen to this now. The Roman Catholic Church in the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s explained in its document, De Verbum, which is Latin for the Word of God. Hence, this is a direct quote from the Second Vatican Council. Hence, there exists a close connection and communication between sacred tradition and sacred scripture. For both of them, flowing from the same divine wellspring, in a certain way merge into a unity and tend towards the same end. Well, let me just tell you that I did graduate work in a Catholic seminary. And they don't merge into one another. Because they fork this. and divide. Because there is constant, constant conflict between Catholic tradition and the Holy Scriptures. And tradition is virtually always the clear and uncontested winner in the, in the Catholic faith. So while all of these organizations I just mentioned, and there are more, but all these organizations, they say that Scripture is so important, but there's always something that's more important and supersedes it. Mm -hmm. uh, and you want to know something? You can't have both. Mm -hmm. Either the Word of God is holy and pure, as it claims to be. Either it is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path to guide us where we should go. Either it is that imperishable sea by which men can be saved, or it's the biggest lie in the world. Like I said before, there's no gray area. It's either the truth or it's a lie. And with that, that's not a three answer. That's only a two answer. It's either or. It's either. <clears throat> You're so cute. All right. The third thing I said is there's always a commitment to the organization rather than a commitment to the Lord. And again, these are very subtle points in most of their presentation, which is why people are deceived and why so many people within the cults don't recognize this because of the subtlety. It's, it's close. Our relationship with the Lord, that spirituality, makes possible a right relationship, that's a religion, with others and ourselves. Okay? Our relationship with God is our spirituality. Our relationship with man, and including our own selves, is religion. The scriptures say this, through James, Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself unstained from the world. I mean, this is what Scripture clearly says. Want to know what religion is in the eyes of God? It is. Widows and orphans in your own self. It doesn't say anything about your relationship with God. Right? Picture the cross for a minute. Okay? Can you picture in your mind the cross? Okay, there is a vertical bar planted in the ground, and there is a cross piece, right? Got that picture in your mind? First, I'm going to give you a couple, two scriptures. A man came to Jesus and said, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. Then, he said, the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. First is your relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Then comes your relationship with the man. If you picture that cross, mm -hmm. now take away that vertical piece representing the relationship from here to there. Your relationship, your spirituality, your relationship with God. Take that away, and what happens to the relationship horizontal relationship, man's relationship with man. Boom, it drops. It needs okay, that sustain. vertical to sustain it, to hold it, to support it. Okay? But there's a proper order here. You have a relationship with God, that gives you the ability to have a right relationship with man. The cults virtually always teach you that you have your relationship with the men, your relationship with the organization, is what creates your relationship with God. No. It's your relationship with God creates your relationship with man. I mean, that is phenomenally important. 
Because you have nothing to, that cross bar has nothing to hold That's right. to adhere but to. But you'll, you'll not have a right relationship with God because you came into a, a relationship with other men. It, it doesn't work that way. You'll have a right relationship with other men because you came into a right relationship with God. And that's why Jesus said, here's the priority. First is your relationship with him. Second is your relationship with men. Because most of the cults will always teach you, you come into the cult, and that defines and gives you your salvation, your relationship with God. Okay? And the fourth thing is a hierarchy which stands between the quote-unquote common believer in God. In ancient times, God selected the sons of Aaron, the Levites, to be priests unto him. They had a special ministry before God. This is the old covenant. Mm -hmm. They had a special ministry before God on behalf of their fellow Israelites, on behalf of them, right? Mm -hmm. The highest of the Levites was a high priest who alone among men had access to the Holy of Holies in the temple. Now, but this is the covenant. This is, listen to the scripture. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Jeremiah 31, 33. Right. It's also found in, in the book of Heat. Uh, he, 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 yes. Okay. So God is saying the, the new covenant is a personal relationship that we have with him, not going through the priesthood. Now, in the New Testament, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, after that atoning work, after the veil of the temple is rent in two from top to bottom, Peter, Peter wrote, he said, to all who are chosen, this is to all of us who are chosen by the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, says, but you, if you're a believer, he's speaking to you, but you are a chosen race to He didn't say that at all. No. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. First Peter 2, 9. We are all believers. This is the, the priesthood of the believers. This is the New Testament. We are a priesthood. We don't have a priesthood out there that stands between us and God. What we have is an intercessor. But first of all, a cult must of necessity have a hierarchy through which and only which it is possible to get to God. That's their hold on people. That's their hold on people. You know, if you, don't, if you don't go through this person, you can't have a relationship with God. Because your relationship with God is created by this person, or controlled by this person. But here's what scripture says. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2.5. One. Right? In Hebrews, that Marcus is talking about. Hence also he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, talking about Jesus, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Hebrews 7.25. And again in Hebrews he says, Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in the time of need. Hebrews 4. So you no longer have to go through a priesthood for the forgiveness of sins or for access to God. You have direct access to God. It's not controlled because, you know, there's a man who has been given, you know, this organization have given him special powers to control your relationship with God. You want to know who controls your relationship with God? You. You control your relationship with God. By the choices you make, by, the, by, by how you surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That's, you control it. Nobody else controls it. The Roman Catholic Church, listen, I, you know, you, if you get offended by this, I would point you to one other scripture, since you all love scripture, otherwise you wouldn't be here. And by the way, if you don't love scripture, and you don't necessarily believe scripture, but you happen to be here, you are here because of one reason. I don't know what reason you think you're here, but if you're here at this Bible study, and you don't believe that the Word of God is 
God speaking directly to you, then let me tell you why you're here. God has painted a target on you, mm -hmm. and he's out to get you. Praise God. Because his word always accomplishes his purpose. That's the truth. And his purpose is that you have life, that you have it abundantly, that you have joy, but above all, that you have a right relationship with God the Father. And you can't get there any other way except through Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me. So if you're here for any other reason, let me tell you, God is digging into your heart with his word right now. The Roman Catholic Church, oh, the verse I was going to say, if you get offended by this, is Psalm 119, verse 165, that says that those who love thy law shall have great peace, and nothing shall offend them. You know, uh, usually, for a person that has not thought about it, everything that you said is true, except for the Catholic Church part. People hearing that the Catholic Church is a cult. They never considered that. Well, the Mormons don't consider themselves a cult either. And the Jehovah's Witnesses don't consider themselves a cult either. But even Protestant Christianity doesn't really consider Catholicism a cult anymore. Maybe at one time they did. Most assuredly they did. Most assuredly they did. There, there was a time, not, not too distant past, mm -hmm. when they recognized the fact that there was a gigantic difference between the theology, the belief system, between the Roman Catholic Church and why Martin Luther had broken away from the Catholic Church and to bring the scriptural truth that salvation is not by works, but it is by sola, by faith alone, right? That, that was the whole thing. That, that exactly what scripture says, that salvation is a free gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And, but now, I mean, not long ago, uh, Alice and I were at a meeting in Manchester, England, and there was somebody there whose, whose job it was, they were a liaison uh, in uh, Slovakia or S Slovenia, Transylvania, in, in, well, in, in that part of the world, um, between the Catholic Church and the Lutherans, bringing them together to pray together and everything. Martin Luther would roll over in his grave. Because I want to tell you something. Uh, it, if they were not compatible, if they were oil and water back in the time of Martin Luther, and their theology is now acceptable to one another, the Catholic Church hasn't changed. No, they haven't. They have not. I mean, they have not changed. So what changed was the belief of some Protestants. That's because they no longer know what the beliefs of the Catholic Church are, and they don't know what the Bible teaches. And they don't believe what the Bible teaches. Okay. In their seminaries, okay. anyway. So, but, but the Catholic Church today, as it has done for literally thousands, of, you know, hundreds, of, uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, teaches that for a person to have a relationship with God, one must go through the ministry of a clerical priesthood. From baptism to the forgiveness of sins, on and on and on. Uh, now, that's, that, that priesthood is distinct from the quote-unquote average believer. And they teach... To quote one of their priests, Father Daniel, Daniel Oles, who was from the Pontifical Angelical University in Rome. I mean, this is not just, you know, some guy on the street. He said this in an, a Time Magazine article. Now, I originally did these notes way back when. So this, this article is from 1985. He said, the Church of Christ exists in the Roman Catholic Church, and the fullness of grace and truth are the patrimony of the Catholic Church so that only she possesses the complete means for salvation. In other words, and by the way, if that doesn't sound like it's true to you, let you go look up. If you have any interest in the truth, and find out that the, the, the Pope, the seated Pope today, Pope Benedict, one of the first things he did was to reiterate the fact that the Catholic Church is the only true church. And only by being Catholic do you have a right relationship with God the Father. That's, that's today. This hasn't changed in all these years. Right? Pope John Paul II spoke out to his flock against the error of thinking that one could go directly to God for the forgiveness of sins. He stated that the forgiveness of sins is a prerogative of the Roman priesthood. That's from an article in the Los Angeles Times. It was a direct quote from him. So what he's saying is, 
If you have sin in your life, and by the way, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. That if you have sin in your life, the only way that that sin can be removed. The atoning blood of Jesus. No, not by the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. He said, by you going to a Catholic priest and having that priest who has authority to forgive your sins. Whereas, the Word of God says that when you sin, that if you are faithful to confess your sins, that God is faithful to forgive those sins. You can go straight to God. That's what I was saying before. Now, you see, God has established authority, both within and without the church. Mm -hmm. And we are to be submissive to that authority wherever it appears. But the shepherd is to serve the flock, not vice versa. Okay? In Ezekiel, I mean, you can go all through the Old Testament, you can go through the New Testament and see this. But, you know, we're in, in Ezekiel, where he talked about woe to the shepherds of Israel. Mm -hmm. and, and Jesus said, and we've talked about this so many times in so many studies here, Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not so among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slaves, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. That's Matthew 20. After washing the feet of the disciples at the Last Supper, Jesus said to them, You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I did to you. John 13. The imitators of Jesus Christ. Yes. Because nobody stands between us and God. But God has put many people alongside of us, connected to us, that we can work together as a body and encourage one another and build our relationships. But your relationship with God is dependent on your relationship with God, not somebody else's, and not somebody else's right to control it. Let me just ask a question. Yeah. Uh, in the scriptures where it says, that we have died and our life is hidden in Christ. Christ Jesus. If our life is hidden in Christ, isn't that how uh, we can access, get our access to the Father? Is when Jesus goes That's kind of, yeah, there was a foreshadowing of that with Jacob and Esau. Uh, and, you know, Jacob, Jacob dressed as his brother and went before right. his father and was recognized and got the blessing. Um, when we go before the Father, Basically, what he's what seeing he is Jesus, Jesus Christ, because he is seeing the perfection of Christ. He is seeing the holiness of Jesus Christ. He is seeing the purity of Jesus Christ. He is seeing the sinlessness of Jesus Christ in us. Because not only has God forgiven our sins when we are faithful to confess Him and repent Him, but He has also forgotten Him. He said, "I will no." In Isaiah forty-three, He said, "I will no longer call Him to mind." It says, "As far as the east is from the west, that's how far He's cast away our sin." So trust him. This is the God that we serve. is a loving God whose desire for you to have, to have that fullness of life. And it's, it is these cults that desire to control you, to serve their organizations. And, and again, let me reiterate this. When I'm talking about the cults, I'm not, I'm not talking about the individuals who are involved. Okay? It's the leadership. It is the, it is the leadership. It is the organization. Okay? That's what wants to trap. Now, now, by the way, the people that are in the cults bear some culpability, okay? Because they have a choice. It's always a symbiotic relationship. Yes, they have, a, they have a choice. They also have a responsibility. You know, God spoke to the prophet Hosea oh, so many years ago and said, my people perish for a lack of knowledge but because they have rejected knowledge. If you don't know the truth about the organization you're involved in, whether it be Jehovah's Witnesses, or Mormons, or the Way, or the Moonies, or the Catholic Church, or, or any, any other organization, you are responsible to know. And God has given you the tool to know, and that is the Scriptures. And not a perverted, modified Scripture, but the Scriptures, right? And the Spirit of God will lead you to the right ones, I promise you that. Because there, there are wrong ones out there, yes. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. 
His desire is not to keep you away. His desire is to draw you to him. But the heart of the Father is he desires that none should perish, but all come to everlasting life. Okay? The leaders of their collar, the leaders of these cults, don't want their followers submissive, because we're to be submissive to governing authorities, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. They, want, they, they don't want them submissive in a biblical sense. They want them subservient in every sense. And there's a gigantic difference. God's not asking us to be subservient. He is asking us to be submissive and to serve one another in love, one another. It's not one group serves another group. It's we, you know, this, this is the heart where we love one another, love your neighbor as yourself. So, you know, today, I didn't even know, I looked this up today because I haven't seen Moonies in a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, and they used to be very, very active, oh, yeah. as I say, oh, yes, when I was yeah. had a street ministry in New York oh, so many years ago. Yeah. So while Moonies were spending 18 hours a day selling flowers and candy to raise money, mm -hmm. some young Moon was living in a mansion, mm -hmm. at rest in his mansion, right? Mm -hmm. We are at rest in the Lord while the Spirit works through us, filling us with joy, while Jesus is building us a mansion. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. That's how this is supposed to work. I mean, you know, it's, it is setting us free. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I have been, I tracked down kids in cults 30, th over 30 years ago, where they were in absolute and total bondage, where they were forbidden by their cult leaders to, to communicate with their families or see their families, but communicate in any way. They were in absolute bondage. But the Spirit of God, Jesus came to break that yoke. How do you know this? The Word of God. Let me just say this one more time. Jesus said, If you abide in my Word, you are truly my disciples, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. In that very same passage in John chapter 8, the religious leaders of the Jews said to him, and I'm paraphrasing greatly, how do you say that we're not free? We're sons of Abraham. And Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. And they freaked out, said, you know, Abraham's our father. And Jesus looked at them and said, you are of your father, the devil. And here, these are Jews. These are the religious leaders of the Jews. Because even that can be a cult, right? And he had no problem saying to these religious leaders, you are your father, the devil. And when somebody tells you, and I don't care how they're dressed, how polite they are, how successful they are, how many people they have following them, how much wealth they have, if they tell you that you have to do that kind of work to achieve a right relationship with God the Father, they are lying from the pits of hell because Jesus Christ did the work. And hanging on the cross, here's what he said, it is finished. What did you say? It's either a brother in error or a wolf in sheep's clothing? Yes. That's, you have to be able to distinguish that, and that's, that goes to the whole issue of this. But when we're dealing with organizations, it's, uh, you know, you, you can look. I guess I, that same thing kind of applies. Because there are a lot of denominations or religions out there. You can look at them and say, well, they're doing this wrong, they're doing that wrong. You can have brothers who are in error, and brothers in errors need to be gently corrected. And then there are wolves in sheep's clothing. The cults are wolves in sheep's clothing. So anyhow, Paul had this all these issues with the Jews, with the people who were supposed to be the people of God, bringing the Word of God. That's still going on today. You need to be able to recognize what is true, what is of God, and what is false, and what is of the devil, the father of lies. And you need to test all things, test them against the Word of God, be led by the Word of God, be led by the Spirit of God, and you need to speak the truth in love mm -hmm. to those you encounter. Mm -hmm. Because people need to be set free to have the fullness of life in Christ Jesus. So, Father, that's our desire. And that's why we come together in your word, proclaiming your word, powered by your love. Lord, that people would hear your word and be set free. That they would find that imperishable seed that brings salvation in a right relationship with you, Father. Because that's what we want. We want to spend eternity with you in a relationship that brings glory to you, that glorifies your Son, that glorifies you. 
So we thank you for your word. And above all, again, we thank you for the word made flesh who dwelt among us. God bless you. Until next time. Your word is a comfort to my soul. Your word is the truth that sets me free. Your word is a light into my path. Your word is a lamp into my feet. Help me.